If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Oh, man. I tell you what. I was really excited to have this young lady into our, our studio. I'm incredibly impressed with uh, what she has accomplished uh, at her age. And, you know, I think uh, when we when we first had her down in the studio, a lot of people uh, were asking us, like, oh, like, you know, she doesn't exactly align with all your guys' fitness philosophies. Well, no, we, we wanted to bring – we want to bring more of these kind of fitness influencers, people who are dominating in their spaces. And Amanda Bucci – on YouTube is is massive. Um, she's got she just started a new a podcast, so she's starting to get into that space as well. And she does like these these like influencer academy, you know, or things. She's very big into charity. She has a very interesting story. Highly intelligent young lady. When we get on the podcast, she gets pretty vulnerable. It's a good it's a good interview. No, it's an it's an excellent interview. And here's the thing, man. There's there is something to learn from everybody. I mean, I know we've got well over 10, 12 years on on this young lady. But to be as successful as she is at the point in her life, I'm extremely impressed. I wasn't there at 20, 20 was she 24, 25 years old? I wasn't there. No, no, she's a kid. But, uh, I mean, she's got great charisma, obviously a lot of talent, um, very, very smart, uh, smart in business. There's a lot of stuff that we talked about off air where it was quite impressive. It's very impressive to see someone build that kind of a business in that short period of time, especially at her age. And she's extremely growth minded. So, you know, for people that, you know, put out there, I remember we put a YouTube out there with her and they were kind of, kind of harassing her and stuff like that about squat shoes and bullshit like that. Like, listen, this girl is, is young. She's up and coming. She, she's already arrived. I mean, she's killing it on Instagram and on YouTube and has built herself a little empire and she's not stopping there. She's not settling for doing that. Like she's continuing to surround herself around other brilliant minds and like-minded people and she's learning, man. And it's, it's very fascinating. I was excited to be a part of that. If we can play one small role in uh, helping her continue to grow and develop, I love her message. I think she's coming from a pure place. Uh, absolutely. And she's, she's inspired you know, millions of young ladies looking into getting into fitness and exercise, people who want to build muscle or burn body fat, all that stuff. She's inspired quite uh, a bit of people. She's and got she, a large following. She falls right into that realness. Like we talk about this on the show all the time, that transparency is king and the future of success on the, on the digital streaming media is for people to be transparent and honest and real. And that is something that she is. And that was something that attracted us to her. That's the reason why uh, we reached out and wanted to have her because we we like what she's doing uh, and we like how she's doing. And I think she's uh, got a really good message for the most part. Her last name is spelled B-U-C-C-I. So you can find her on her Instagram at, at Amanda Bucci. You can also find her amandabucci.com. You can also find her Amanda Bucci on YouTube, and then her podcast is called Bucci Radio. So you guys can find her at all those places. And we also did a YouTube. So if you guys are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, you guys can go to our Mind Pump TV on YouTube. Uh, we did a, a cool little What's in My Bag with her. And if you're not subscribed already to the YouTube channel, every single day we drop a new YouTube video. And we're doing more and more of the vlogging and entertainment side. So not only are we trying to provide lots of education and information for you guys as far as the fitness side, we're also trying to uh, give a little bit of the entertainment side. So if you guys are not subscribed, go to the YouTube channel and check out Mind Pump TV. Also, if you're a new listener, if you're just popping in right now, the program that we recommend everybody start on that we offer is MAPS Anabolic. Now, this is expert exercise programming. It comes with workout videos and blueprints. It's very different from the other uh, kind of workouts you may find out there. It's extremely effective at building muscle, improving performance, building strength. Whether you're a man or a woman, uh, MAPS Anabolic is typically where we tell people to start off. If you want more information on that, go to mindpumpmedia.com. And again, without any further ado, here we are interviewing Amanda Bucci. First question. Uh, tell us about your parents. That's the first question. <laughs> <laughs> they go right for the heart. No, yeah, absolutely. Let's go. Actually, yeah, that's a good yeah. question. Can we just get started? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. yeah we might as well. Yeah, yeah, we were all, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Okay, so. Yeah, tell us about that. I want to know how you started, like how this all went down. Uh, okay, so my mom's name is Linda. Hi, Linda. She's probably watching this video. Right oh, hi, Linda. Hey, she's Linda. She's you did a totally good job. Watching. Yeah. My dad's name is Tom. He probably doesn't know what live video is, so... 
not saying hi to dad, but he's he exists. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my mom is a teacher. Well, she used to be a teacher. She's a guidance counselor now. She's also part-time at working for me as my bookkeeper and just momager type deal. Um, but she's awesome. She's no like, way, wait, she works for you? Yeah. Oh, that's fan- mm-hmm. that is. Do you guys get along that yeah. way? or? Yeah, we get along. So, if, so it's kind of like role reversal. Like if she messes up, you're like... Gra- it's not like messing grounded. up. Yeah. <laughs> it's more like it's more like how does she balance mom and and like working with me at the same time because yeah. she's very mm. much protective over like the finances and like trusting people. I'm like, well, now it's a business and it's not really trusting people. It's trusting that they'll stick to their contract and their NDA kind of mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, she's amazing. How, um, how long now? How long has she been working with you? Only the last like year, maybe. Okay, half so year. this is relatively new. Yeah, and, and she so just far, started so good. doing it. She just started doing it. She's like, you need to keep track of your expenses better. And I was like, okay. And she like just started doing it. If, I was like, all right. If you think about it, like, what better person to look after your finances than your own mom? Oh, totally. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, they're the ones that are gonna be like, all right, listen. Yeah. All right, you don't need to buy the goat. Like that's a waste of money. You know what I mean? Like, what are you spending this on? No, but she started doing it, and then obviously it it just turned into like too much for her me to be like okay you can't just keep doing this for fun on on the weekends like it turned into a thing where she was spending a lot of time so now she's working with me let's but. that's let's, awesome let's go let's go back up on mom and tell me like how well, give me something that she gave you as a child like a life lesson or something that stuck with you into adulthood oh totally so um my parents got divorced when i was around 12 and it wasn't like a bad divorce it wasn't like i never saw them fight or anything but she just Um, I lived with her, my sister and I lived with her mostly throughout the rest of our lives. And she was like that independent woman, like completely just going after what she needed to do to make sure she would, she could provide for us. She went back to get her master's degree in the middle of like the divorce and us moving and then us being in high school. Oh, she's a badass. Yeah. Yeah. She's a super badass. So I've always just grown up with like the independent woman mindset because of her. Oh, wow. Yeah. She's now, okay, so that's uh, definitely obvious. You can see your strengths that come from that. 100%. What are some of the challenges that have come from that, from having parents that split at that age and then being kind of having a woman that's really strong, but maybe not have the, the male side so much? Yeah, I guess um, I, I totally can't, I guess, imagine it being different. I didn't struggle too much with it because I think I just didn't really know what was different. Um, again, the male figure in my life was never like super prominent. Like I saw, I saw my dad, I still see him and stuff, but it wasn't very like prominent and in your face. Like we have a really close relationship. So I guess just, I mean, maybe I'm like an intimidating woman to, to men. Um, luckily I have a boyfriend who's not intimidated by me, but I guess that's very much still a thing that happens. No, talk about this. I'll tell you what, that was, uh, when we met you, yeah, that's interesting that you would even say that. Right. We we had, we had dinner and, uh, I, when you meet a woman like you who's, who carries herself that strong, I mean, I think it's impressive that you just came down here on your own you, and you act like it was no big deal. And I'm you like, were like, who are you bringing with you? I was yeah. like, nobody. Yeah. And, I, and, and, <laughs> and you're so young. Right. I think that, so talk to me about uh, how you've dealt with that probably turning off guys because it's maybe too strong for a lot of guys. Oh, I mean, before I met Brian, I met him back in December. I was single for like three years. And again, I'm like young, so it wasn't a big deal. But I was like, am I too, too aggressive or too maybe... I don't know what the word is, like too too intimidating or whatever, because a lot of guys are like, they want to be the alpha. They want to be like the person that's maybe they're taking just, care of. They're just insecure. Yeah. I mean, insecure. that's what it is. Yeah. It's just like a societal kind of thing that men feel like they have to be. It's you know, just, that you're interesting. That's uh, fascinating you say that. I mean, I trained uh, a lot of uh, doctors and surgeons when I had my wellness facility. And I had a few, uh, I had one female surgeon and a couple uh, doctors and all of them were single. Mm. And uh, it, they were incredibly intelligent, incredibly confident. Female doctors? Female, female. Mm. But they would tell me that that was something that would happen. Guys would get intimidated because I think, uh, you know, insecurities. Like, you know, yeah. if you meet a woman that's really confident and strong and makes more money than you, then maybe well, that makes means you I'm feel weak or whatever. kind of weird being like, you're, you don't have to be the caretaker and like be the white knight or whatever. Like take care of somebody that's like a natural um, maybe something men feel like they have to do as they grow up but when you meet someone who's like already good and they don't need you you're Mm -hmm. like oh well okay you're too much for me like you like you know when you want someone to want you not necessarily need you but when a woman needs you it probably feels you know it boosts your ego that's right and for the kind of people that need that yeah yeah Yeah. so have you always been like an overachiever kind of yeah like i definitely grew up like 
enjoying school. I loved it. I loved reading. I loved learning. Um, I was in like high level classes and stuff. I didn't always have an easy time, like especially with sports. I did not have an easy time. Um, I loved intellectual learning and I excelled with that pretty well, but I didn't necessarily excel in sports super well. So I would love it. Like I loved the learning. I loved the challenge. I loved the athleticism. Wasn't super good at it. Hand-eye coordination is meh. It's funny. I have a um, trainer I told you guys about. He trains me twice a week now. We do some like boxing with the um oh i've seen your video the bag, oh, the bag. What's that? like mm-hmm. little I hate speed bag oh speed bag I fucking hate that <laughs> it's just i'm so terrible at the hand-eye coordination that and like a lot of reps. he's like you gotta do this and yeah. this and i'm just like i can't and then i would do one and then like it would go back and forth a bunch yeah and then i could never get it again and it would be so embarrassing so i still <laughs> he, he still has me practice but it's just same thing with like um lacrosse i played lacrosse in high school Catching the ball was like the the thing that held me back the most. I, <laughs> oh, the whole I was so part, excited. That's really tough. Cradling I've, is okay. Couldn't uh, even catch the ball though. Like just mm, hand eye coordination. Well, that was my problem. So. Yeah. Do you think Do you think that made you better and stronger because you weren't the greatest at all those sports and maybe you probably had to work a lot harder? Totally. Yeah. Totally. I like felt like I had to try harder and I like forced myself to do um, more camps and then I would get a personal trainer and that like got me into the gym. My mom was uh, very athletic growing up too. And my grandpa was actually a professional power lifter when, like back in the day. Oh, wow. So That's she, awesome. So you've yeah. got them jeans in you. Yeah, I got the jeans. And he was Is it the Irish excited. grandfather or the Italian grandfather? The Irish one. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's so national. He was know. so excited when I started doing power lifting. It was like amazing. But yeah, so she got me into the gym and I, it forced me to practice and become better so I can get better at the sports. Little did I know it wasn't really even the sports that I wanted to continue doing. It was the training and the getting better and the challenging myself was what I really liked. And the program that I got into for um, in high school was essentially to get better at being an athlete. So it was like a strength and conditioning program for kids in high school, all ages. So it was like mi- some middle school kids. Now, some did you fall in love school. with it right away when you started doing this kind of training? Uh, kind of. Like, I liked the little group of kids that we had because I felt like I finally, like, was decent at something. And then the people in my little group were, became my friends. Mm. I didn't super love it. I wasn't like... Were you were you really popular hell. in school? I was like that. There was like a weird person in between, like, the popular kids. And it's the all right. Ones. You could say you were cool. No, no, no. I was Still friends. To be with, humble. I was like friends with the cool people, but I also was in like the nerdy yeah. classes yeah. and stuff. This is so what like, I'm, like so a I'm, floater, and I'm picking up on this was. not because I think that's what you know you you fit in terms of that, but it, it's almost like you're the way you're talking about working out. Like you felt like you really fit in for the first time. Totally. So before that, you didn't really feel like you fit in, in into any particular group. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very interesting. Cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. So you fell in love with it. You're doing it. Your body. Sh- no, you didn't fall in love with it at first. At first, it was the group. Yeah. When did you fall in love with the training? I think I fell in love with the training when I started doing, um, I was in high school, sorry, in college. I just finished high school, got into college, and I think I was really loving it. I realized that I loved it so much when I didn't go to like the regular college gym, and I literally brought my car in order for me to get a gym membership. So I, I was like very dedicated to fitness at that point. I loved training and I loved like making new workouts for myself and it was just really enjoyable to me. So I think like the ending of high school and then into college, especially because the last year of high school, I played lacrosse um, because I didn't get on the soccer team. So it was like the the, the backup um, wasn't super good. Played the bench junior year, senior year. I was like, I still want to be on the team, but I don't want to sit the bench the whole year. So I'll be the bookkeeper. So I did the <laughs> books. Um, and then I was just like, you know what? I would rather spend my time at the gym. Because I'd rather go do that and like be with that group and train versus like play around in the cold, wet field in Rhode Island, um, practice with the team and then not even play. Mm-hmm. So it just drew me obviously to go to the gym now, more. Now a lot of time for a lot of people, when we find this kind of passion for working out, all of a sudden we're like, oh my god, I want to do this all the time. It's my favorite thing to do. A lot of times it's motivated by you know it's a new thing that I've never done before, and I, or it could be um, I like the way my body's changing or it could be, you know, like for me, what motivated me to really work out was it was based on my insecurities, my body image issues. I was a really skinny kid. So I fell in love with working out because I could change that. And it was this thing I could manipulate and mold. And did you find any of that for yourself? Yeah. I mean, I definitely was starting to feel a little bit insecure in high school. It wasn't super prevalent though. It wasn't like 
I never had those stories where I was like, I feel like I'm looking at myself and I feel, well, I mean a small bit, but it wasn't like a very prevalent part of my life in high school, I would Mm say. Um, But then in college, I did my first bikini competition because I I was very like body conscious and I liked training and I did want to like look better. I didn't look bad by any means. I wasn't like overweight or anything. Um, Always kind of healthy, focused on that, but I never nailed down the nutrition part of it. I always liked exercising, but nutrition, I would um, be a pretend flexible dieter and I didn't even know. I would eat like white omelets and salads and then I would also just like love Oreos and whatever the heck else I wanted at night and then college drinking. Yeah, it was like by accident. (laughs) So it wasn't necessarily because of that, but I got into the competition because I saw somebody, a friend of mine do it. And I was like, oh my God, that must be like the secret missing link to like me getting to look the way I really, really wow, want to. It was like the next level for me that I was Did like, Did you okay. feel like you needed the competition to motivate you to get to that leanness or was it just the training and stuff for it that you were? I think it was like the nutrition for it mm. that I was like, oh, this is like the magic piece. Mm. I, cause I, I don't know. I was trying some different things. I would, um, mm. I would just try to eat cleaner. I remember in, uh, in my, I forget, freshman or sophomore year of, college it must have been freshman year because i would do five weeks before halloween because like i don't know halloween i was in a sorority we'd all go out and wear like slutty outfits and shit but <laughs> that's, what Justin, that's what justin does so like get he's, ready for like the, holiday get he ready for the it, jasmine yeah. costume yeah. what's funny i'm the devil this year <laughs> he's uh what do you yeah, i'm what, a mouse what, what, duh oh you're a mouse duh. <laughs> <laughs> he does the french maid he yeah. missed the reference <laughs> I, I, I did Sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll connect here at some point. Okay. Yeah. don't worry keep trying <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, back up. I tried to basically eat clean before Halloween so yeah. I could look a little bit better. And I was like, it worked a little bit, but not really. It was like a couple weeks, you know? So it, I realized how quickly I could change by changing, changing my nutrition. And I was like, oh, wow, this is the magic piece. It was a meal plan though. And I did it for, it was a five week prep for like my first little OCB show I did. So it was like, eat this, uh, you know, oh, specifically, yeah. this is the same food was it every the, day. Was it the standard, you know, tilapia, asparagus mm-hmm. type of... <laughs> yep, so it was, so um, you, you thought it was a missing piece. Little did you know, you were about to embark on some horrible dieting stuff. Oh, I mean, some I horrible know. shit. Yeah. Well, luckily, so it was only five weeks and I realized in at the end of it, I didn't obviously had no idea how to like get back to normal eating, but I was like, I don't fucking want to do that ever again. Like I didn't get into the whole let me just eat clean forever because that's the only way. I like stopped after the show and I was like, I don't want to, I don't want that anymore. That's terrible. I don't want to give up like things that I like. So that's when I found flexible dieting. And I was like, oh, this is the magical piece. And then I started doing that. And then I prepped myself for a show using flexible dieting and it worked great. And I was like, this is great. And I would do the whole like, let me fit pop tarts and candy and ice cream mm. into a bowl. And like, oh my God, it magically fits my macros. Oh. And um, did all that. And then I did my first competition, second competition using flexible dieting. And that was when I moved to Los Angeles for the first time. That like the, the, sh- the second show that I did was in the middle of the summer when I first moved to LA. So you're in Rhode Island at this point. Mm-hmm. You come to LA, you're doing the competitions, you're starting to be more aware of this whole world and, you know, looking at it yourself had to be a lot a massive culture and shock then, yeah, and then you go to la which is <laughs> yeah. like in venice yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. oh yeah what was that like because like la is like the root of all like insecurity like you go to la and all of a sudden you're like oh man you know? vanity land was it like that would have been total polar opposites huh was it that would that that challenge you even more or were you like this is great it's california um kind of i, I was definitely like naive and just gung-ho to just be there um I did get there I did my competition I felt really great about myself but it wasn't I was in Venice so it wasn't like Hollywood or Beverly Hills where everyone's an actor or a model it was like weird people everywhere (laughs) and like super diverse culture um tourists everywhere I was a waitress on the Venice boardwalk on it like sweet where the crazy people everywhere walking yeah. up and down every day and it was just songs like, and roller crap. skates yeah. and our our attire for the restaurant that I worked at was like whatever the heck we wanted it wasn't there was no and then I also worked at a restaurant back in Rhode Island and our attire it was like a fine dining restaurant I had like a mm. button down and a tie <laughs> and they were like wear whatever you want <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> there was this one girl that would wear like those Sophie shorts and like a crappy t-shirt. What's, I was like, you like just wore your pajamas. Sophie, what are Sophie shorts? Like those cottony shorts. 
that that like cheerleaders wear, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Cotton, oh, yeah, cotton yeah, yeah. shorts. I appreciate yeah, that. You can get away with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> What's wrong with that? I wear those all the time. Yeah, what? <laughs> so so you so, move, yeah. What are you starting to put together? Now, you're, you're you're now over there. You're you're you've done this. You've done it a couple times enough to get in competing shape. So you've seen uh, yourself probably in the best shape I would imagine in your life. Mm -hmm. What things are you starting to learn about yourself? Like in just your relationship with exercise and food. What are you starting to piece together at this point? Well, yeah. So this is where it will it will kind of take a turn for like the negative. Um, so I, I did the show, it was great and all that stuff. And then in the middle of the summer, the show ended and I had friends come to visit me in LA. I was like, oh my God, so fun. It was my birthday. And then all of a sudden I catch myself eating this like bread pudding and I couldn't stop. And then I would get another oh, one. Wow. And then here it goes into like, now did you have the, the awareness right then when it happened? Or is this like you later, like looking back? Oh, I had it right there. And then, oh, oh shit. Wow. So you, oh shit. This is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the, the summer that I started binging a lot. So it must have been probably, it wasn't that long and it wasn't as severe as other people, but it was definitely like binge eating a lot. Mm. Um, I had like a little calendar on my bulletin board that said like this many days, no binging. And like, I would have to do that whole thing. Um, Let me ask you this. When when, when you're doing this, uh, and you're, so this entire time, you know you're doing it, you're writing it on your calendar. What are you thinking like while it's happening? Are you thinking like, this is weird, this is a strange behavior, I need to be more, more aware of it or... I, I I was very confused, number one, because I had heard of some people doing it, but they were the clean eating people. And I was a flexible dieter, so I was like, I didn't deprive myself of certain foods. Why is this happening? Little did I know, caloric deficit is why. It's not necessarily just because of the foods. Um, and it also probably was because of the flexible dieting a little bit more, too, because like... Um, because you're introducing those, you're introducing oh. those foods all the time. Hyper palatable. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Those those foods are engineered to get you hooked oh, on them, yeah. and so when mm -hmm. you're introducing them like that, and then you put yourself in a deficit, and, and then the, you get freedom afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's just like and a the, recipe. For and that's that. really it. The root of it really is uh, the mentality around food and the relationship with food. Because what happens when you do competitions to a lot of people, not to everybody, or when you treat food that way, even if it's flexible dieting. You, there's, there's two gears that you have. There's either I'm on or now I'm off. Mm -hmm. There is no lifestyle that exists other, other than those two. So when you're on, you're on. And when you're off, you go way yeah. off. Totally. There's, this is no different than the way scientists now view addiction with drugs. In the past, uh, or for most of the time we've understood addiction or what we thought we understood of addiction was based on models of, uh, of mice or rats being put in a cage and given the option of drugs or water and food. And of course, the rat goes back to the drugs over and over again until it dies. And we're thinking there's a chemical dependency. But now scientists realize that if you take that mouse and you put it in like mouse heaven or rat heaven, give it access to food and fun and sex and all these other things, and you give it access to drugs, very few of them become addicted. So it's not so much the substance, although that plays a role, it's also the environment or the state of mind that the person's in. And so when you're in that state of mind where I'm on diet or I'm off diet, when you go off, you go off. You see what I'm saying? It's like right. this moral thing that happens. You see this happen with uh, with almost everything else. So, so at this point, this is happening with your relationship with food. Mm-hmm. What are you starting to do at this point? How are you piecing to get it together? How are you moving forward from that? Yeah, I mean, I again, I, I struggled a little bit. I would go, you know, in the, into the cabinet, get the cookie butter jar, eat it all and stuff like that. So my, I guess like the biggest thing when I was thinking about it was how can I stop myself from, from the starting point that will like trigger, it's the trigger thing. Like what's the trigger? How can I you know, stop doing that. And the only thing, which is not something that I, I would, I did because I wanted to cure myself. I started another prep and that's not necessarily, obviously the thing that you would do to, to cure that or fix that or whatever. Um, but I was just like, that's the only way I know how to be motivated and stop doing this. So I did another prep. Um, I probably started that three months after the last one had ended. And I was just like, you know what, I'm going to do this. And then that went really well. I did another one. I did another show. It went great. Um, and then the binging did come back a little bit, but it was less so. So I was focused more on after that prep, it was focused on like, okay, I'm going to do a reverse diet. I'm going to focus on getting my calories up. I was doing all this by myself too. And I was like, 
I'm not going to binge and even that mentality still being in my head and the whole on off thing you guys are talking about. It's very much so like on off season and on season. So determining between the two, it was always very difficult because that's where the freedom comes in. That's where you start to feel like you can do whatever, um, especially when you're focused on flexible dieting so much. So it was I think I slowly was starting to like think about it being a lifestyle, but I didn't really know how to make it that yet. Now, what mm. role you're doing YouTube at this time? Mm, no, not Instagram, yet. Instagram, Instagram. Yeah. Are you at this point? Because I think I had like ten thousand followers. Because you're you're uh, very transparent to your your audience, to your followers and fans. Were you transparent at this point with your Instagram? Were they? aware of this with you and was this part of you being coming helping yourself with your awareness by sharing it with them yeah yeah Excellent. actually mm-hmm. yeah i That's i great. was like very cool. good about sharing um i did i remember the first time i shared it and i was like terrified to share it and i made like i bet Instagram you got post. incredible feedback oh yeah there. all yeah. Of the all of the great people feedback. always appreciate that yeah. yeah and then you have like no idea now the amount of times that i've shared things that are like terrifying or struggles I am I'm waiting for the feedback because I know so many people are just going to jump on it and mm-hmm. be like, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you first do it for the first time, it's like, oh, I don't know what people are going to think about me. But we, it's so yeah, it's all your laundry out there for the world. You <laughs> right. know, it's like it's one crazy. of our one of our early episodes was on our motivations for when we first started working out. And it was all I mean, we were all insecure at some point, you know, being the skinny guy or whatever, not performing. And. We talked about it for an entire episode, right? And it, it was it felt really good. Like uh, doing this is very therapeutic. That's why I asked you if mm-hmm. if it played a role in you becoming aware of what, you know what, what you were going through. Mm-hmm. It definitely plays a role for us. But yeah, you're right. After we did that, I remember after we did that episode. I was like, oh man, I wonder how many people are going to hear that. And Even just doing YouTube and podcasting is therapeutic, talking about yourself. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's like you have a therapy session with either yourself or with other people. Yeah. And it's, it allows you to just express that in a safe environment. How, now, how many shows have you done at this point where we're at right now in your life? Like, have you, because you, you did eight total, you said, right? Yeah. So are you four, five in? How many are you in right now? Three. Oh, you're just three, three in right in. now. Okay. So now, as you continue on this journey and you start doing more shows, is are you each time kind of catch picking up things and learning like it, this is good bad what are you what are you going through as you continue to progress and you're learning about your relationship with food now and exercise yeah totally so there was a few things that i picked up the second time that were like good slash bad so the first thing that i picked up from my first like structured reverse diet was that the more food that you eat doesn't necessarily mean the more muscle you're going to build in your off season so i had to go through like getting a little um like gaining a little fat and i was like oh This didn't work. And then I also realized that the more food you eat in your off season doesn't necessarily mean the more food you're going to eat in your prep because I had to get lower in my second prep. And I was like, I'm so confused. Like, why do I have to eat less? Because I did Mm. my reverse diet and like it should have been magical. Like it should have just allowed me to eat more. But that doesn't necessarily happen. This was was your fourth. This is the fourth. Yeah. I think your metabolism is now starting to react to all the shows. Totally. Yep. And that was like the the beginning of my metabolism reacting to the shows. It was just it was just getting there. So I did three shows that summer. I did um, one national show I didn't place, one local show that I got an overall at, and then another national show that I didn't place at. So I was like, yeah, okay, like whatever. And then I started a really strict reverse diet again, and I stayed really lean. It was one of those where you would add like 50 to 100 calories or so every few weeks, stayed super lean, even got like a little leaner after the first show and started like looking better because I was filling out. And I did I, I did it very strictly and I was tracking everything and I was still into tracking everything. I was very like I was living alone. Um, I had I'm I new to L.A. again, so I didn't have too, too many friends. Right. And I was just like, I have no reason to go out and eat something off my, my meal plan or my macros or whatever, because I don't have that many friends. And <laughs> I was like, I don't have a boyfriend. I don't have date nights like. None of that. So yeah. I was just like, so why would out, I go? You came out to LA all by yourself or did you have family there? I had, or? um. so the first summer that I lived here was just for a summer and then I met people at my waitressing job. Oh, so wow. when I moved out for the second time permanently, Man. I had that like couple friends. That must've been a, a huge growth period for you. Oh yeah. That, that transition. Totally. Especially cause I'm kind of like introverted and I won't necessarily just go meet people. I'll be like, I am in the same space as you, but I don't <laughs> I don't know. I was terrified to meet people. So, so at which contest did you start to really put this together? Is it at this point where you're like, okay, my metabolism's reacting a certain way. I need to. 
Yeah, and and I knew I wanted to do the reverse diet thing too. However, I also that year entered the bodybuilding.com spokesmodel search. So here it is. I finished my competitions in July. August comes around, September comes around, and then you apply to the spokesmodel search, and I got in. So I, you know, you need at least double the time that you prep to go back to homeostasis at least. Mm -hmm. I never did more than like four months. So three months or so went by, I applied, started dieting again for the spokesmodel search. And I specifically remember that winter, it was over the holidays. Again, I was in LA, I didn't go home for the holidays. I went in between because I still didn't have a lot of money. And I was like, it's really cheap to go home between November and December. I'm gonna do that instead of go for the holidays. And I hung (laughs) out with my friends for the holidays. Um, I like made cauliflower mashed potatoes for Thanksgiving and I had like that and turkey and vegetables and like, that's it. Um, Tracking all that for Thanksgiving. And I was like, you know what? It makes me feel good. I'm gonna do that. Um, and I'm like prepping for this bodybuilding.com spokesmodel search. And I remember specifically for that, it was like an eight week prep for that in the middle of the winter. And I specifically remember when my body just stalled and I was like so fucking pissed. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, why do I have to do this? I remember being so angry that I did like fasted hit cardio in the morning because I was like, why isn't this working? So you're pushing that. harder and harder yeah, yeah, yeah. to get it to respond, which mm. is exactly the, only way to go from there, <laughs> the opposite. Right? Yeah. What's what's happening is, and you know, you, you gave us, you said you have, you said something like it, sh- it should take you twice as long to come out of your prep as it does to go in or something like that. Well, it, like if you prep for four months, at least eight months off. So I've heard that, and uh, people have repeated that a lot of times. But that is uh, that's a number that is, uh, I think, just given by coaches. That right. They found. It's just like a. The interesting thing is if you if your body learns to adapt to become very very efficient, especially through repeated exposures to sub calorie diet and lots of energy expenditure, you start to develop uh, adaptations that last much, much, much longer. I would imagine. No different than than when you lift weights or or try to build cardio. I'd imagine coaches say that so they can get their clients back into a a prep. It depends on the person, but if you start to Some coaches just don't know, too. That's what I dealt with a lot. I mean, a lot of the coaches that I talked to when I was going through the MPC and IPB, uh, I kept thinking that as I moved up the rankings, I would meet like these just really brilliant coaches that were giving really good advice. And a lot of it is, you know, passed down kind of bro science from one coach to the next. Of Because if you take anybody for 12 weeks and you restrict them by 500 to 1,000 calories a day and you tell them to do cardio for an hour a day, two times a week, mm-hmm. you know, change. Yeah, their body, they're going to, you're going to get lean, you know, it's a, but yep. it's what you're doing to that metabolism. And then what happens afterwards that I don't, I don't think a lot of them are really talking to these girls and guys afterwards. I met a lot of men's physique and bodybuilder guys that can't, couldn't figure it out. And they go in the off season, they put on 40 pounds, you know, right. it's like so bad. And none of that, none of that is good weight. I mean, literally you're maybe getting 10 pounds at most mm-hmm. if you're anabolically enhanced of muscle well, and the other 30 is all bad weight. And it's funny because we will refer to it as a damaged metabolism or my metabolism's broken. But in reality, your body's doing exactly what yeah, it's supposed it's super to. super efficient. Yeah. It's becoming very, very efficient. It's doing a good job of doing it. Um, but, you know, it does so by down-regulating receptors for certain hormones, which then your body produces more of those hormones to give to try and give you the same effect, and you get this kind of cascading effect. You get in women a progesterone estrogen imbalance that can happen. Many women will lose their period or won't menstruate. Um, and mm, I lost mine. For abs- a while. Yeah, and so that's and by the way, that is a very obvious. And I want you know I know we're on your channel and you have a lot of female um, fans, and for those people who diet and want to compete, like that is a clear sign that your body is getting very adapted to becoming efficient, not necessarily a bad thing, but kind of is, especially if you keep Well, what, Amanda, that. were you, did you notice any other signs? Were you going through, like, did you notice like sleep, sleep or energy? Hair or loss. Hair, or skin, or did you, anything nails. else you go through? Uh, no hair loss or anything, but definitely energy, definitely the sleep, especially last year. Um, so back kind of like to the, to the timeline thing. So the spokesmodel surge happened, that was in January, took two months off gained 10 pounds in like the two months. So I was like, I'm going to do a little bit of a bulk before because I had planned on starting this prep because I was like, I'm taking my YouTube channel seriously. I'm going to do this prep. I'm going to document the whole thing. I had this whole like elaborate plan. And that prep, that prep got me from like 6,000 subscribers to like 100,000 in six months. So it was like, you know, all of these things kind of happened for like partially for like career purposes. Mm -hmm. But there was lots and lots of dieting. So I did that second prep that year 
And then, and again, it was a really low, um, really low calorie. And then I like lose the timeline, but the, the prep this past year was the worst one. And it was very low calorie. I would like take naps after I woke up and ate my breakfast in the morning. And, um, it was just my energy was super low. I felt like brain fog and all of that stuff. No hair loss or anything. And I also wasn't doing that much cardio. Like my coach took more of like the lower calorie, oh, less good. cardio approach for the adaptation purpose. So, and that's rare. That is that's, very that's rare. rare. He's, a, he's a very smart yeah. coach. He's so, not, so not obviously you had a good coach. Thinking. Right. Yeah. 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 He's a very good coach. So, and he kind of just flowed with what I knew was my best career moves at that time and mm. he's really aware of my health and aware of the, the after he's not one of those people that leaves their clients after they're done with prep so um it wasn't that bad with the cardio but definitely like the low calorie um mess with my energy a lot but i was just like i'm gonna keep doing it did you notice any <laughs> digestive issues through this mm. process yeah oh, oh, yeah wow. i had some digestion problems um especially there was one point in like one of the preps that i did where i was eating like broccoli slaw Firm, and I was like, I can't. I was like, I, I can't. Like, what's going on? Like, I was so bloated, so bloated. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, you know, that's uh, broccoli is one of those um, vegetables that is really. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's salt, high in sulfur. Yeah, uh, something like that. Cruciferous. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. yeah. I said that as a yeah. question. Cruciferous. That's the answer. Yes, yeah. cruciferous. That's cruciferous. The, that's the word. Yeah. So what what was what happens is especially through hard training is you get this hyper inflammatory response and. The gut becomes inflamed. That's your gut response to everything. As it becomes mm. inflamed, uh, you get. I would also be very bloated on show day. Yeah, because mm. I was like stressed. It's Not it, like you get inflammation. In the gut causes dysbiosis, which is the back gut bacteria is off, and we know that controls so many things from mood to attitude and stuff. But besides that, when your gut is inflamed, the food you eat the most. Uh, some of it will travel through the gut lining and your body develops antibodies mm. and you develop food intolerances, which is super common with competitors so they would because they'll eat the same food over and over during this like starved state and also this hard training state. And it just right. sets up this stage for this immune response. And then all of a sudden they have food intolerances like, oh, I, to I all the food that they're used to eating. That's usually where they'll start happening. You'll find like, oh, I used to be able to eat that. Now it makes me super bloated or, right. you know, makes me constipated or whatever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. So at this point, happen. so 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 this this is happening. When do you decide you want to stop and not do it anymore? So last year, what's it now? October? Mm -hmm. It must have been a year ago now. So I did my last show last year and I was just like, you know what? I'm going to do these shows. I said that I was going to do them. I finished them. Um, and I literally started breaking down at the end of my last show. I was like, I just did the hardest thing that I've ever been through. It was just did you like break down on your channel too? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you I've did done that, that a fast. couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it real. Keeping the crying in there. Yeah. Um, I, I don't tried know. that it one just... time. Didn't work. <laughs> really? <laughs> I was like, ah. No, we believed it. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> it wasn't believable. <laughs> Somebody so, ate yeah. just so this, this actually, this <laughs> is still, I would imagine, um, you're still probably, I mean, kind of growing through this. It's only a year ago that you did your last show. Mm -hmm. um, I remember what I found that was really crazy was when I was going through the process, I was fully aware of what should happen to me afterwards. And I still partook, you know, I still would find myself kind of binge eating on totally. stuff. And it's like, and I knew damn well, like, and it was like, yep. whoa, if I, if that's happening to me, like how many other people, like they're just oblivious of it, aren't really thinking about it, right? right. Like that's what went through my mind right away. Yeah. So last year after that last show, um, I had a couple trips planned. So like I went to New York, I went to, I forget where else, Vegas for the Olympia. And I was just like, I am so burnt out. Like I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I just ate whatever. It wasn't necessarily necessarily like binge eating like I was previously like secretly in my home but I would just go out with my friends and just like get whatever the fuck I wanted right um and that like went on for a few months and it was just like you know you give yourself some period of time to like be free and like let your body relax and stuff but I did it too frequently and too long so I gained 20 pounds last year so I was like 113 on stage and I got up to like 139 was my highest this year so it was like 25. So last night we had dinner and uh, you kind of saw something that uh, I hacked into myself that I created because when I was competing um, I found that just going for a walk afterwards, like, yeah. are there new rituals or thing, habits that you've now created that were positive that you've kind of taught yourself because from the whole competing process that you do different now that you weren't doing before? Yeah, totally. So uh, during prep, I had to create 
stress relieving strategies for myself because I, number one, realized cortisol was screwing up my fat loss. So I was like, I have to de-stress um, whenever I would feel very, very stressed because I'm like prone to anxiety. Um, and my body would just react like my gut would react very, very bad. So I learned how to meditate and read and relax. So I started meditating because of prep. Um, still not one to do it super consistently, but I do know every single time I do it. And it's one of those things that I'm working towards doing it daily. So I, it's, it's not something that you can just do to fix your stress. It's something mm. that you can do to prevent it from happening frequently and str- more strongly for yourself. Um, so that's definitely the number one thing that I've learned how to do since competing. Yeah. Anything that you still kind of struggle with, like that you maybe see yourself catching bad patterns or habits or kind of starting to go back to, do you ever notice anything? Yeah. Uh, let me see. There's definitely, I guess some just food focused stuff and then training focused stuff. So mindset behind training now, I, it's not fully there, but like my goal is to just feel good with how I'm training. I'm still getting out of the mindset of like, I will do this to look better versus Mm. I will do this to feel better. I'm Mm. like, so getting there. I'm definitely on the other end of the spectrum more so now, but doing things for the motivation to look better is definitely a competing mindset. Thing you're that I you're to moving out. very quickly. Yeah. You are, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you're moving. So this, this, I this surround myself with a good hyper people. aware. That's, yeah. And you know what? I will say this. Uh, we've said this all the time. Maybe you can chime in on this, but uh, since we started the podcast, I grow at 10 times the speed I did before. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Same thing yeah, for you. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. I, maybe because we talk about it so much and we talk about ourselves that and all the, the people we get to well, meet. Yeah, yeah, the the minds that you're hanging yeah. around with. I mean, yeah. it's, it's always nice to meet other really growth minded people and then listen to their journey and the things I think we pick up something from every interview that we do with somebody. Yeah, totally. So so out of all the things you're doing, the YouTube and the podcast, uh, where is most of your focus going right now? Are you really trying to put a lot of energy in the, in the podcasting arena more? Like where are you, where are you thinking business wise right now? Yeah. So, I mean, the podcast this year didn't require a whole lot of my energy. Like it was easy. I live in LA. It's easy to meet people. It's easy to just do it. And then I have like a, an editor and someone who does the blog posts and stuff to get it up there. I haven't focused on growing it too much in podca- podcast realm. Like I've done podcast interviews and I think like you guys said earlier, that's like the number one way to get exposure for podcasts. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to do that more. But um, this year was like so much growth and change and transition and like stretching myself with business, my my own physical fitness goals, my mental wellness goals. I have an, I can move to a new place. I got a new boyfriend. Um, you know, there's all these things like new businesses, obviously the podcast, um, my coaching clients. Uh, I started a f- fundraiser with a couple friends for Pencils of Promise. Like there's all these things that I'm doing this year for like building purposes. So yeah. I'm like laying foundation for stuff this year. Do you year. ever feel overwhelmed at all with mm. carrying all that? Yeah, yeah. 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 What are <laughs> what, what do you notice in yourself when what, when you see that coming? Do you Like the way that I react yeah. to, yeah. So there's like, interestingly enough, I talked to Jordan Syatt, um the other day on a podcast mm-hmm. and he works That's for Gary tr- Vee. You know the trainer Gary Vee's, yeah. Um, and he told me that Gary, he won't physically show his stress to other people when he's overwhelmed because it doesn't, allow anybody else to feel good about the situation like mm-hmm. it just makes it worse i'm the opposite i <laughs> make sure everybody knows that i'm stressed it's which terrible. is probably healthier let's be honest <laughs> yeah i let everybody know um sometimes i just get really overwhelmed like and flip anxious. over desks and chairs <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. She's not feeling it today yeah, yeah it's just one of those things where i kind of just get really overwhelmed i make sure everybody knows i have to talk about it um i have to have a plan of action. If I don't have a system in place or a support system in place, because I've hired a lot of people this year for my team. So I'm like, you know, there's only so much bandwidth you have to do the amount of things that you're doing. And then delegating to other people is important as well. So when I kind of realize I'm getting there, it's either like something has to give or I have to put something else into the system, like another person. Do you 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 have any mentors or anything business-wise, like people that are really helping you with this right now? Yeah. Um, So I hired Lewis Howes this year and he, we started in January. He has this mastermind program that's 20, I don't know, 25 or 23 of us or something like that. Mm. And it's a year long program. Essentially, we just get together three times a year. Um, We'll do calls once a month with each other and just talk about what each person is either struggling with or going through or needs support on. I have learned so much from that group this year. It's like absolutely crazy. Not even just business strategy and practical stuff, but just mindset Mm. around business, mindset around 
life. It's not just about business growth, but it's about personal growth and the impact you're making on the world. So not even just Lewis, but Lewis is really good at bringing together amazing people. So the people in the group, we've all like really been able you to- got, You have to expand on, I, I just, what I find so fascinating about that is uh, someone at your age to make the decision to make that type of investment. Yeah. <laughs> I, I let, let's no. Let's talk about that. You're like, so mature. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm sure a lot of. I'm I mean, sure a, a lot way. of people yeah. uh, watching right now or listening right now uh, probably don't know how much that costs. I know it's not cheap to do that at all. It's no. a major. Probably could have bought a car uh, instead, and you didn't go buy yourself a car. You decided. Yeah, I got a Honda Civic though. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, let's talk about that. Where did that? Where did that come from? Where did you, I mean? Who? I would have never thought to do that at that age. Like I, I would have gone and bought myself something if I had those kind of funds. So who who instilled that in you to to reach out and continue to grow yourself like that? That's a good question. I think my mom, again, was very much so, I've always been very practical because of her. Um, I've always not really been materialistic. Like things to me don't really mean a whole lot. So the the reason, the, the thing that sparked my interest in the program was that throughout the last year or so, not this past year, but 2016, um, I was growing my business just on YouTube. And I realized last year, like I wasn't really an entrepreneur. I was just doing YouTube, having sponsorships, um, did really well with just promoting my sponsors and vlogging. And I was just, it wasn't really promoting so much because I was just vlogging and living my life and they just showed up. So it was really easy for us to have a great relationship. And I wanted to take a step back from making so many videos every week. I was like, I don't want to really vlog that much anymore. Um, I also was like last year gaining the weight. So I was kind of insecure, to be honest, making videos. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I need something else that's not me having to be like look a certain way. People were starting to like, you know, call me fat and shit on YouTube all the time in the comments oh, YouTube's section. YouTube's so great, isn't it? Oh my it's God, YouTube best. trolls are the best. Thank you guys. guys. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, Shout everyone. out. I'm just Not kidding. The people yeah. watching are nice. Troll69, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know you are. <laughs> yeah. no, no, really no, no. though, YouTube can be tough like that. Talk about that. What was that? Uh, I we shared on the show. I mean, it was the one time I got emotional. On the yeah. show. It was when we first started. I got like a lump in my. Throat. It was like uh, it was like our first like it was, br- it was brutal. Our first uh, non five star review that was left Ooh. on our show. Oh no! And it was totally directed at me. And like Aww. I remember yeah. like that feeling the, the first time that happened. It, it hurt like, my throat. Totally single them out for no reason. Uh, you know, oh. I don't even remember. Well, here's the worst. They, they, he the wor- gets so mad. <laughs> no, the worst part about it. Here's what happened. This is why uh, it was. This is why it was. He hated it so much because. It awkward. It wasn't a bad review on Mind Pump. It was a great review on me, a yeah. great review on yeah. Justin. Yeah, they Everybody loved, they loved us, apparently. And then yeah. Adam sucks. Like, he's like, get rid of Adam. He sucks. Wow. Just like yeah. it must be an angry old girlfriend. It had or to be it, an it just hit me right. Yeah, no. Yeah. I actually, I don't think. I have, Literally, I've been. Uh, I've the been, things that friends. they say that like hit you right where you're already insecure oh, yeah. and you're like, yeah. Yeah. well, Which, you know what? That's so, why you grow so fast. So, to have you. And that's, yeah. Yeah. that's where I was heading with that was, um, you know, what it, uh, it was a major eye-opening thing for me to realize like whoa like I can't believe that affected me like that and it, it pointed out my own insecurities totally do you uh do you touch on this like in your influencer groups and stuff that you you teach are you do you guys get into this I don't think they're my my students in particular are people who are really just getting started so they're totally not in the realm of like being bashed yet yeah. you know I feel like you have to maybe break a certain threshold for people to like you you gain a lot of success and then people start to care about being mean to you yeah so they're not there yet but I will eventually, but um, yeah, learning how to deal with that stuff is like a whole other podcast. It's interesting. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say when people ask, like they meet you and they don't know you and like they ask you like, well, what do you do? Oh, that's, yeah. yeah so, what's your job? Yeah. Now I say that I am a, an online educator because I, I mean, I like to use that word. Um, I say that I have a YouTube channel, a podcast, own a couple businesses. I don't like, it's hard to even say what it all is. So I kind of try. You don't have an elevator oh. pitch? No, I need to. I need to build one because that's been so. It's evolved so much this year. Mm-hmm. It still is. I'm in the middle of like a rebranding with like a marketing. Well, guy what's the What's too, the so. why behind what you do? Like wh- why Why do Why do you do all that? Oh you- yeah. So my my overarching goal is essentially to show people that they can do something that makes their life feel fulfilled. Like they feel fulfilled in their life based off of either what they do or their mindset behind why they're doing it and what they're doing. So whether that's fitness, whether that's health, whether that's their business, um, that's my overarching goal. And that's why I like to focus on the value of the podcast episodes and the YouTube videos. That's why I'm like vlogging. It's not really helping anybody. Maybe it's entertaining. 
uh, whatever. Like, it's, it's, I don't feel connected to it. Ah, that's actually really mm. cool. I feel the same. I feel it's more uh, the soap opera part of the business, right? The people yeah. just want to kind of connect to the day-to-day stuff. It's like, what are you really learning or getting from this? But then talk about what that's like to feel almost attached to that because you know that there's a ton of people probably. And that's how you that, started. Yeah, right. people yeah. want that. And like, I rewatch my old videos. I'm like, these are really fun. <laughs> I kind of miss them, but I just like don't feel inspired to pick up the camera in the same way anymore. And I get like being a role model based off of how you live your life on a day to day. You know, like there is value in that. It's like seeing how someone lives versus like just talking about topics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like you can really see what you're doing and what the other person is doing and then how they live and how you live. And I get that to an extent. Yeah, but, but then when do like, you when do you have your life then, right? Like exactly. what what is yours? You know, what do you have for yourself that you're not sharing with everybody else? I think a lot of people don't really think about that. I think a lot of people probably look at you and they're just everyone's they're very envious of all the people connected to you and that look up to you probably. Yeah. And you think no one thinks about like what does that mean for you? Like, you know, hey, maybe I don't get a lot of my own life, you know? Right. What's it like for you, like uh outside of your relationship with your boyfriend? What about like friends and people you hang out with? Do you get a lot of time? with that or do you sometimes almost feel alone for somebody who's connected to so many people yeah there's totally that like aloneness feeling for the um massive connection and i think that's why when i first got started with youtube again i don't have that many friends i wasn't doing a whole lot of stuff i was like alone to like youtube was my family like they were Mm. they were my friends yeah and it's just like funny (laughs) (laughs) But, but that's where it came from and that's why i like was so excited to do it every single day and now that i've kind of like built my life and I have businesses, family, friends, friends and family. I live with my boyfriend, but friends and family, I probably could be way more connected to um, if like taking steps back from like what I'm doing during the day with business stuff. Yeah. Um, I probably could spend more time with them and talking to them and being more connected to them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is that struggle of like, I want to show my life still, but like I also have a really great one now and I kind of want to keep it to myself, mm-hmm. not in like a selfish way. But just uh, um, well, no, it has to. You be. know, it's necessary. For yeah, and it's not, sanity. and it doesn't, it doesn't even matter Selfie. if it's selfish. It is, I mean, you have to. You know, you can only pour from a full cup. Yes. You know what I'm that's saying? That's what I've been learning a lot. And that's year. a very important thing to understand because, uh, as much as I'm a parent, so I have two kids, and it's very easy to fall into the trap of being a martyr for your kids. Mm. But the reality is, I'm not going to be a great dad or the, the the father that they deserve if I don't take care yes, of myself. Absolutely. If I'm not my best, then they're not going to get my best. Absolutely. So you, you it, it sounds counterintuitive, but you have to focus on you so you can focus on yeah. everybody else. Absolutely. We were ta- we talked a little bit about this earlier when we were getting coffee, but uh, I want to ask you here on the podcast, um, are you dri- what drives you to do what you do? Is Are you driven by inspiration and by your passion or are there other things? In other words, can you find yourself... D- is it, are you able to do things you're not necessarily inspired to do or is that like death? I used to be able to because I thought that I had to do everything on my own. I didn't know anything about teams. I didn't know anything about outsourcing. I didn't know that I couldn't just hustle and do all like heavy effort, heavy, heavy grind, heavy hustle. I was just all in on the hustle and I had no idea about anything else. Like I would work just in the morning and all the way to the night. And again, like not really a whole lot of life outside of that. And I was like building and I was okay with that until I, again, realized how much more there is to life. And I was competing. Competing was building my YouTube channel. Things were going so well. My Instagram was growing. Um, I was connecting to a lot of different people and it was just going well for that. And the grind was the only thing that I really knew. So now that I am able to take some steps back, I'm really motivated by time, like quality time with people. Quality time is my love language. I don't know if you guys do love language tests. Have you ever done it? I've read the book. No. Yeah. What's so yours? I've, I, I think I'm a touch guy. Uh, I'm, I you know, <laughs> I like, I'm, you gi- I'm a receive are. gifts. Yeah. You're like, a gift? Yeah. Gifts is I like fashion. shiny things. So. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hence why I said, if, that's why I was so impressed that, you know, I remember, getting to a point where I had that kind of money and and I know I know mine stems from as a child I didn't have a lot of money at all we were poor and so mm. when I finally got to a place where I could buy things for myself it wasn't until I was in my late 20s that I really started to reinvest into my personal growth and education right. so I find that really fascinating that you did that early but I also know too that mine's stem from my childhood of want, right. wanting shiny things yeah. interesting is one of them a communicator or something like that uh words of affirmation there you yeah. go that's mm. me Cool. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So you're a quality time. Quality time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So quality time is important to me in terms of being able to have the time to, make, to spend the quality time. So I'm motivated by having more time. So if things can be more efficient, um, if I could, you know, 
I won't do something that will like stretch me so much anymore because I would prefer stopping work and going to lunch with a friend than like getting something else done, you know, yeah. or like going to dinner or like enjoying myself with, with people. I really like one-on-one or like two-on-one or three-on-one interaction. I'm not like a big group type of person, but if I can get quality time with people, that's what I'm motivated by and like the people that I really care about. So, cause you said you weren't a material person. Yeah, so, gifts, gifts are my last one. So, <laughs> so um, do you have a big, like, do you have a, a good concept of money? Or for you, is it more like, I love what I do, and this is great also, and then sometimes I'll go on vacations? Yeah, that's kind of it. I never really <laughs> had, like, a bad view of money, but I also didn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't poor. Like, my parents did well. Mm-hmm. They were able to pay for my first year of college, and then I got student loans. I also did my waitressing on the side so I can make money, but if I ever needed anything, like, my dad would come down and um, take us out to dinner and give me and Lindsay like 50 bucks or whatever for the week and stuff. And so I wasn't like poor. Um, I didn't have like a bad view of money. But like whenever I started, I was really, really into making money for myself. I was like, I don't want them to give me anything. Mm. Like at some point in the middle of like early freshman, sophomore year of college, I was like, I don't want I don't want you to give me stuff. I want to like work for it. So um so I, what was your question? Original question? <laughs> but, well, the con- so some people like- Oh, the money question. Yeah, so like, cause that when I first, uh, when I was 19, I was managing gym. So I had staffs, 30, 40 people working for me. And I was making six figures and this is back in 1998. Um, so it was a lot of money, but I didn't have any concept of it because I lived at home. I didn't really, I didn't buy things. I don't care about things too much. Right. I just loved what I did. And so it was just like, oh cool, I'm making money. And I just put it in the bank. It was like the, yeah, it's like it wasn't a big deal. Effect, right. Yeah. yeah. It, it, do you find yourself like that? With, yeah, oh, totally. Okay. Yeah. Like there's, it's, it's there and you're like, great, but it's more of like, now I'm like investing a lot back into my business. It's just an exchange now. It's not like you know, when you get to a certain point where you feel really comfortable, it's there's not much more that will make you happy aside from less money problems. Mm-hmm. So once you hit a threshold where you have minimal problems living, I feel like after that is where it's kind of, I mean, for me anyway, personally, it's kind of like it's an after effect and it's more for increased growth. So like the more you can make, the more you can invest back in it and the more it can be better and the more you can build better relationships and the more time that you can have and you know, like investing into things that will give you more of like whatever you're motivated by, whether it's time, whether it's like some people are motivated by, um, I forget what test it is, but someone said there's like time, challenge, money, and like something else. So some people are very motivated by- (laughs) It's like the Facebook survey I just filled out. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, depending on which color you like, it tells you. (laughs) Yeah, well, time is mine. What what care what characteristic about yourself would you think, or would you attribute to most of your success? Is uh, what would you what would you say has got you this far? Like that you've you've leaned on the most. Like I'm this type of a person, and that's carried me this far. Um, I think honesty Hmm. is it's like a weird thing, I guess the one constant in all of my social medias over the last, I don't know, since I started was like me just being very honest about everything, really open, really transparent. Um, I don't hide my feelings. I very much so express all of them all the time. And I think that's helped me get to where I am today just by whether it's connecting with my audience members or just being open to people I work with or people that I love or live with about how I'm feeling. And that's success in all areas of life is because I've been so honest and I haven't been shy to ask for help. Um, I don't feel disempowered. Is that a word? Disempowered Mm -hmm. by asking for help or like being the person that's looking for growth through other people, like educators, mentors or whatever. You would be surprised. Well, actually, I was surprised. I don't know if you found this, that <laughs> when you ask people for help, they usually do it. Yeah, no, like, yeah. that's yeah, great. Thank you for asking. It's very nice. Yeah, it's correct. Like you'll go up to someone who you think, like, why would this person help me? They're so... Well, you have to th- ask it in a certain way. Oh, like how? <clears throat> like, you can't expect them to just... I mean, it depends on who you're asking, why you're asking it. If it's someone that you've maybe... They have 400 videos on their YouTube channel and then... I don't know, however many podcasts. And then you ask them, what's the best way to lose fat? That is the worst thing you can do because you haven't done your own research. Like Ah. you have to, you have to do your own maybe trials and errors for yourself. Like you go through this, this and this, and you're like, I want to get to the next level. I think you're the greatest person to help do that versus like, Hey, can you help me? I would super love if you answered my DM. 
it's a little different. Yeah. I love that you address that that's, because that's, that's something that we all deal with. That's a challenge, right? There's people that all of a sudden drop it on the page or they heard from somebody that, oh, ask the mind pump guys and you just come directly in. You ask a question that if, Give me all, the formula. if all you did was go to our YouTube and see that we've like categorized- your website, right. or like get your programs, right. spent time building. Right. Like the least could do that because it is tough for, and, and I'm, I think you're very similar to us where we're trying to connect with as many people as we possibly can and answer as many questions. It's like, you know, I can't go around and answer everyone's specific specific question, especially when I've already created something for that exact answer. Totally. Right? And you like spend time creating things so you don't have to answer that question a thousand times. Right, mm-hmm. right. So. I know for us, I just love meeting people. So if, if people ask a question and I think, you know, they're genuinely asking or whatever, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll answer it. We had, it's a vibe you get. We've had people come in and sit in on our shows and, it, and they're like, well, why did you let me come in? I'm like, because you asked. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. it's yeah. cool. You know, we get to you know get to meet new people. So yeah, so totally. So looking forward, like, what are you excited about moving forward? Where do you want to be? You know, in five years, ten years, like, what's the big plan? It's like funny you ask that because this is like the first year that I even envision what a five year would look like. Last year, if you asked me this, I'd be like, I don't know. Everything <laughs> has changed so much, and now I have actual businesses versus just making YouTube videos and having sponsors. Like obviously in my head last year, I knew that wasn't long-term and I was like, I don't know what's next, but now I kind of do. Main focuses are a couple different things. Um, The podcast is like so fun for me. It's a really number one great way to connect with really freaking awesome people. Like you guys said, like the amount that you learn through speaking with other people is just mind blowing. Like even today and yesterday meeting you guys and just talking with you guys, you guys are so experienced in podcasting you have so much life experience in so many different areas you guys are all really different but you have a lot of value to bring as a team and as individuals and then it's just again just really fun talking to people um i think it brings a completely different type of value to audience members you get to hear from different people different perspectives and the whole purpose is to give you something that you can take away and you can learn and grow from yourself. So it's not even like we get to grow. It's like everyone else gets to grow with us. And it's great. Um, so I love that. And YouTube is a little like that, depending on how you set it up, I guess. So mm-hmm. figuring out how I kind of want to create video content that, that connects and resonates is something I'm going through now. Um, I have my businesses. So my coaching clients that I have, absolutely love that. Like my goal is not just to like get as many people and shove as many people in there as possible, but to like actually get these people the results that they're looking for is really important to me. So consistently working on building that and making it better, making the experience better. Um, I just had a live event this last weekend and it was just like the experience for these people. They they cried, they figured out like their life purpose and like I had a life oh, wow. coach come in and stuff. And um, That's awesome. Yeah. What what scares you about all this? What, what are you Not mo- being good enough. Oh. oh, I was so scared like when I first started. What do you mean it. by that? Not, not good enough for everybody else or what do you mean? Not good enough to get them the results that I'm telling them I can get them, I um, guess. Do you feel like an imposter sometimes? Oh, totally. Only, like, I know that I've had success for myself, but I know so many people have success for themselves a little bit, and then they, like, go coach people. And I don't want to be that person, but I know that my heart's in the right place, and I know that I have the right resources and the right drive to make sure that I do everything I possibly can to make it the best program ever. Um, but you know, it's still new. It's not like I've been doing it for 20 years and I used to be, I used to be this and I have this background in business and I have this background in this. Like I don't, but I have the heart and the drive and like the genuine care to make sure these people get what they want out of it. And like last weekend was a confirmation for me that I am doing the right thing. This is very similar to what it's like for coaching our clients, getting clients in shape. Totally. And of course, you know, 80% of them still fail at that because it still takes them to put the work in. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's very similar with what you're doing with the influencers. Are, do you already have to kind of have conversations with yourself around like, you know, I need to be understanding that that's going to happen and not beat myself up over it. I actually like totally compare it to fitness coaching. Because I'm like, I completely am aware of when you are a fitness coach, you can be really great, but someone also still might not get results because even though you're really great and what you're giving them is really great and maybe you've given them everything in the whole entire world, but they still might not succeed for whatever reason within themselves. So I, I like comparing things to, to fitness and fitness coaching because they, they connect a ton. Right. A lot of parallels with that mm-hmm. for sure. And, and again, being the coach, I remember having to 
kind of figure this out. And then you also get better at, I think, setting the table, right, for them, the expectations, right? Giving them better perspective on, all right, listen, you're not going to just turn on your Instagram or your YouTube and all of a sudden you're going to have a half a million people. It's mm-hmm. going to be hard. You're going to go through this. Like, yep. so, is this a lot of stuff that you guys talk in, inside the class and stuff? Oh, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, cool. it's like a, it's like a intensive program. So they like are very aware that it's not going to be some magical quick fix. It's, it's a lot of like mental work. It's a lot of emotional, like if you're, if your brain and your mentality isn't in the right spot for you to grow and stretch yourself so you can help other people, it's, it's gotta be worked on throughout the process. So you've been around a lot of great minds. You're a part of the Lewis Howes group, which I think is awesome too. Uh, single best business advice you've gotten. Oh, so hard. Hmm. Invest in a coach. Mm. Grant Cardone was one of the speakers at um, one of Lewis's events. And he said like the best investment he's ever made was his $3,000 that he invested in his first coach. It just helps you accelerate way faster than you would if you try to just figure it out on your own. Cause we all want to super ego boosting mm. if we can figure it out all on our own. But when you have people who have been in your shoes and are where you want to be, and they're just, you're paying for their insight and their wisdom. It's like, it makes so much sense. It's invaluable. Yeah. It's invaluable. I think a part, another reason why a lot of people don't do it is when you hire a coach, it's like, now you're serious. Oh, totally. Yeah. When you pay, you commit. Mm-hmm. When you pay for something, And that's scary for a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. It's high ticket price. Like, yeah. oh, I have to actually do it. <laughs> 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 I'm not just like paying 200 bucks for something super quick I can get online and then just like it, it sits there. Like, no, 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 you're committed, you know. Any, any bad advice that you've been given that you just totally like, oh, disregarded, that was terrible. Oh, that's that's good. Bad <laughs> advice that's terrible for business. To just focus on social media. Hmm. It's it's like that was where my main focus was just, it wasn't necessarily because of business. It was just because I started on social media. It was fun. I like to share. It just kind of happened. I kept doing it naturally, but not necessarily for business. But I think people think that, Yes, you have to be on it, but no, that's not the only thing you should focus on. You should focus on things that move the needle forward for you, building out the things that you're going to be doing, not just like building out your social media and like making it pretty and then like engagement and the algorithm and all that stuff. Like, yeah, it's important, but it's not <laughs> but the most after, important. Right. What comes yeah, after like, that? You know? <laughs> yeah. What do you find then with people like that? Do Do you get that a lot where... They're so focused on that. But then at the, at the end goal, it's like, well, what are you going to do that with? Because we talk about this on the show a lot. Uh, a lot of times people It's like think, when you're focused on supplements. Right. Instead of like building your fitness foundation. It's the same thing. Right, right. Very similar, right? Mm-hmm. It's You're talking about splitting hair as a difference by the supplements you're taking. Like that's not a big deal. Well, when that's you, what people see. That's why. It's what they see. They see the, that's the mm, surface. And it's so- not the, It's not the, what's under the iceberg. That's right. So you see the surface and for the average person, that looks like it's the most important thing because that's all they see. They don't see all the other stuff that's beneath. That's the real world. Well, I also think that people don't, a lot of people don't see, uh, I think you put a lot of thought into even the pictures that you post and the content that you put out there. Um, what, what are some things that speaking to the YouTube and audience and people that are probably wanting to be influencers, what are some of the do's and don'ts with, with social media and Instagram? Oh, this is good. So some of the do's are definitely to storytell. Storytelling is like something that, like one of the most important things you can do as someone who's trying to grow and build a tribe and connect to people because people connect through stories and you are the only thing that separates you from like the next person who's doing fitness on Instagram. Obviously, you can like create really creative content. If you're a super creative person, you can do something original that's not new. Um, but you're the only thing that I always say you are the only thing that differentiates you from like the next fitness coach or like the next person on social media. So definitely differentiate yourself. Um, Not only differentiate yourself, but tell stories. Um, Things to not do is, again, just focusing on the wrong things, focusing on only doing it for the likes and the engagement, but like making the impact is more important than Mm. the amount of followers and likes that you have. Mm. So people are just like, how can I get more more and more likes? I'm like, what, are you doing anything with them? Like, are... What are your people liking your stuff for? What are they getting out of it? What impact are you making? Because it's not even just about the followers anymore. Like, yeah, having followers helps you get more opportunities because people see it as a status symbol now. Like, even you guys are like, oh, it's a great opportunity to get you on. Like, what you know, it's like, it's a st- <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a status symbol, but you're just connected to a large, she large amount of people. out right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, snap. I was like, no. But, um, but the impact that you're, like, if you're small and still growing... 
focus on like how can you make this the few people who are already following you lives better because if you're just an extra person that's just like posting pictures of themselves emojis for captions you know there's not like a whole lot of substance behind what you're doing yeah. you're not gonna make it in the long game like you're just gonna well do you, know. you just want attention i mean is that why you're, you know that's the thing you get people have to ask themselves like why am i doing this for attention because if you just want attention that's easy mm-hmm. totally, but if you want to totally. turn it into business or if you want to help people or whatever attention's easy attention right. is very very easy it's, i mean i can't tell you there's there's pages that have i know pages with a quarter million followers on instagram who uh, will try to sell a product or a program that they're put together and will get no response because totally. their followers literally could give a shit. All they care about is yeah, right. liking their pictures. I want to marry you. you yeah. Know, that's about you know? it. Well, if yeah. you're if you're also intending to, you know, start a social media to build a business, um, what are some of the things that maybe were good investments for yourself like to get started? Like did you do you use like a better camera for like photos? Do you use is there certain like stuff that you use for YouTube that's worked really well for you for someone who's just starting to start get started yeah um i think in terms of cameras and stuff honestly like if you're gonna get started with photos like an iphone is pretty good if you don't have an iphone or an android like turn the hdr on on your iphone or whatever and um focus on really good lighting and focus on all that stuff having a good camera totally helps having someone take photos of you who you trust that can take good photos that knows angles that knows lighting um that's definitely the biggest game changer for attention and marketing purposes because if you're taking shitty photos, like no one's even going to see your stuff. Yeah. Like no one's going to click on it. No one's going to find it. No one's going to care. You know, it's just the attention game on Instagram, especially is super, super strong. Yeah. It's like, you have to scroll and like mm-hmm. be something that pops out. So if you're not focusing on, if you're being lazy with your photography and your videos, it's not going to be, it used to, it used to be able to be good for you. It used to be able to kind of, um, be the bare minimum that you can do and it would work. But now that there's so many people growing on social media, there's so many people that have a lot of followers and there's so many people that are signing up every day. So it's the, it's the attention game. Now, do you follow a lot of like the new apps that are coming and do you, do you find it important to use Snapchat and Twitter and like, what do you, what do you recommend for people? I think it's important to use Instagram stories. I think it's really freaking important. Yeah. Um, if you're using Snapchat, that's cool too. But Instagram stories, if you use it, it's like the poor man's vlog. I, I heard someone say that once. I was like, oh, that's good. But <laughs> vlogging, I think, is super connective and emotionally connective because you get to see what people are doing right now. You get to see their faces. They get to talk directly to you. And I think a lot of people forget that they should like talk to people. Mm. You should speak to your people. Mm-hmm. You know, like you have to talk to them, not just like take a photo of your sock. That's mm-hmm. cool socks. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm wearing chucks. You I extra hope that fancy this, you today. Know, yeah, yeah, he doesn't yeah. normally do that. So like instead of you just taking your photo of your chucks and hope that people who like chucks are also connect to you, talk about something that you know connects to them versus just taking the photo and being like someone's gonna scroll through um i think a number one instagram stories helps with the algorithm instagram wants you to use it if you use all the features even better i think instagram stories is super important um and then twitter is cool still i think it's hard to connect all the social medias together Mm. um you can but you have to purposefully you have to like be intentful and uh, strategize how you do that strategery (laughs) strategery i think i was trying to say that but i was like "Eh." i'll make it up for you (laughs) yeah great great do you have now do you personally have uh favorite platforms that you use uh for one just because you like to use it and or two ones uh you find convert to money better than others mm, email list converts ah mm. the best that's it yeah, everybody says that. that from everybody yeah. everybody says that you'd man. say well you- i did it so interestingly enough i did a launch that was like a very marketing style launch where we did email list stuff but i also did instagram and social media posts and like i did youtube video stuff i i'm almost positive almost like 75 percent of sales came from the email list sequences versus me posting and telling people about it. I also spent a lot of time with that launch, um, hyping it up months and months before. I had a Facebook group that we would ask answer questions in about the program. Um, I made videos showing what I was doing with it. But if you're doing digital stuff, it's really hard to like visually show your experience with it, you know? <laughs> it's like, I'm on my computer again. Here's another thing of me working. You know, it's kind of just hard to show that. So I did you talk to do about like it. dramatizations, like Lego stuff. Like, oh, hello. Yeah. This is what I built out today. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah. Um, but definitely focusing on like hyping it up and building it up and being really excited about it on your own social media is great. But I do think 
email list is still decaying for Everybody conversions. says that. Everybody we've talked to says that that's and probably it seems uh, so dinosaur, but it yeah, seems that it, way. It, it but converts, I, but yeah. I think people are used to clicking on things in emails, though you know. Yeah, they're not used to where you do most of your Instagram. business if you think about it. And yeah. that's and it's also it's not like you're just emailing yeah. random people. Like these are people you've been talking to you and helping through email. So it's yeah, like, and you're not just like selling through them to selling them through email all the time. Like you're writing maybe um, valuable stories or valuable tips. Like I'll, I'll like share things with my email list um, a few times a week that are like helpful to them. Mm. Um, send out podcast episode blasts and all that stuff. So like things that they like to see. Mm -hmm. it's so not there's just value like, there. Yeah. 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 Do, yeah. do you work a lot of hours? Yeah. I would say so. I'm How, like, to do what, less. what time it do you start? What time like do you stop during the day? Be uh, honest. My goal is to start at eight and my goal is to stop at four, but like lunch in between. Mm hmm. That's not but bad at all. That's your goal, but what happens? That's a goal. Um, I just started having that goal two weeks ago. Oh, okay, awesome. So, <laughs> <laughs> is it working? <laughs> Kinda. Awesome. Over the last like few weeks, there was some things that were already in place, like this meeting today, and I mean, I guess it's still like nine to four or mm -hmm. whatever today, but um, but yeah, there was there was like still some things in place that I was like, okay, I can't get around that, but like my goal is to just set up like meetings and interviews and any other just computer work during the day so i'm not doing it like in bed at night and stuff like that so like my goal is to make sure that everybody who has responsibilities to do things for like the next day and my mm. team is all doing them during those hours so Very i don't have cool. to get back on well uh we are happy um that you're here because we really think um there needs to be more voices like you in this you know wellness optim you know optimizing your life and fitness world because there's so much noise there's so much mm -hmm. bad information and it's it's especially to uh to women and girls um and to have a young girl like you who competed and did all that but sends this great positive honest message is awesome that's thank why you. we like yeah. having that's why we wanted you here yeah. on our show yeah thank you guys so really appreciate yeah, it's it encouraging <laughs> hopefully we're best friends now yeah, yeah. we are all right we're we're your awesome favorite. to talk to you guys well she already told us <laughs> we're her favorite podcast yeah. ever <laughs> that was the next question yeah. i'm What's sure we'll be there. definitely think that we'll we'll this will be a regular thing i mean i tell you what we're, we're only a plane uh flight away we go down to la all the time so i'm sure it's a we'll, quick hour flight. Yeah, that's right i'm yeah. sure we'll do plenty of collaborations in the future i was super excited to have you here uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks. Thanks so you much. can find us at Mind Pump. Our website is Mind Pump Media, and we also have a YouTube channel, MPTV Mind Pump TV. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at MindPumpMedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Maps Anabolic, Maps Performance, and Maps Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.